Okay, it's time for the last uh, last talk of this session. Uh, it's about remote sensing uh, analysis on urban uh, research at scale uh, by uh, Rand Goldstadt from the New Light Technologies. Yeah, thank you. So, thanks for coming. Um, in the next 20 minutes, I want to show how free satellite imagery can be utilized for um, urban research and specifically to map um, urbanization and build a plane cover at scale. And all this analysis that I will show now is done in Google Earth Engine, which is not open source, but is um, free for non-commercial um, use. So as you all know, urbanization has been a fundamental trend of the past two centuries and the key force that shapes many dimensions in our world. In 2007, for the first time, more people lived in urban areas than in rural areas. And by 2050, uh, more than two thirds of the um, global population is expected to be urban. Um, urbanization, of course, has many positive implications. It helps grow economies, enhances opportunities for education, and in general, improves living conditions. But at the same time, it also creates immense challenges to society and the environment by damaging ecosystem, um, greenhouse gases and air pollution, and putting pressure on public infrastructure. So this means that tracking the rate and the patterns of, of urbanization is fundamental for any sustainable urban development. Now, traditional me methods to map urbanization include ground surveys, um, administrative data, or aerial photographs in high resolution, which are, of course, um, expensive, time-consuming, and making it very hard to monitor changes on the ground in close to real time. On the other hand, there are currently close to 2,000 um, active satellites that constantly orbit Earth and collect data from every location um, on Earth and provide this data in close to real time. 600 of them are designed specifically for Earth observation applications. And when you apply fancy or less fancy uh, machine learning um, algorithms, you can extract meaningful information from this data. Now, um, I guess that most of you heard about um, Landsat. Landsat is one of the main satellites that has been used for um, urban research and in general for Earth observation applications. Um, it's actually a series of um, eight satellites where the first satellite was launched in the um, 1970s. Um, and, and Landsat is collecting data from every location on Earth every 16 days in a special resolution of 30 meters. All this data is publicly available because it is owned by the US government. All this data is stored since the 1970s, which you can already understand that it allows us to track how Earth is changing um, across time. Um, in 2015, um, a new satellite was um, launched, also a series of satellites, um, Sentinel, which is the European version of um, Landsat. Um, Sentinel collects data uh, from every location um, on Earth um, at, a special, at a temporal resolution of every five days in a higher special resolution of up to 10 meters. So the red, green, and blue, whatever we're used to see in the eyes, um, is 10 by 10 meters which is better than 30 uh, meters. And this is also publicly available. Um, I just wanted to show you this demonstration because it shows that um, even with this um, Sentinel-2 data, which is free, you can see changes on the ground and also detect individual structures and also action of uh, buildings. So we have all this data that is constantly being collected since the 1970s. Um, and right now we are unable to analyze all the data like we used to do um, in our own laptop. Um, we are talking about, you know, everybody's talking about big data. This is big geodata. There's a vast amount of data that needs to be analyzed, which means that we need to reconsider the capacity and the methods that we will use to analyze this data. Luckily, there are more and more cloud-based computational platforms that allow you to do this analysis um, and scale it up across space and time. One of them is Google Earth Engine, which I will uh, present now a few research studies that we did in Earth Engine, which is a cloud-based cloud computational service for planetary scale analysis. It has petabytes of imagery um, and also algorithms that allow you to do the analysis, which means that you don't need to download or upload the data um, and, you don't, and you do all the analysis on the cloud. And it has many, many, many algorithms for, many, um, algorithms for machine learning applications. So the trick or the main challenge is how do we convert all this data that is collected into meaningful information that can really be used to improve decision making. There are many approaches for machine learning. We, had, we heard a few of them, supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised. In, in the remote sensing domain, um, 
the supervised image classification is frequently used, and generally speaking, in supervised image classification, we use real examples, we use labeled examples, to train the machine to learn the characteristics of whatever we want to classify. So in the case of urbanization, we will need examples of real urban areas, which we will use to train the machine. We will ask the machine to learn what are the characteristics of a built-up pixel, what are the characteristics of a vegetation pixel. Based on what the machine learned with all the examples we provided it, it will try to predict the class of any pixel in the universe. The main challenge in any supervised image classification is where do you get training data? Um, and especially in the um, urban research domain, this is a big challenge because where do we get millions of examples that can be used for supervised image classification to map all the built-up land cover, all the urban areas in the world? So I want to show you three approaches that um, um, we used to map urbanization, um, starting with the simple one and uh, moving to the um, more complex one, which is uh, more um, transfer learning oriented. So the first study um, that we did um, also in Google Earth Engine was to map um, the entire, all the built-up land cover and all these um, in India. Um, for this application, we created a data set of um, 20,000 um, labeled examples. Um, we hired students in UC San Diego um, who helped us label um, these um, 20,000 examples. And by the way, are, this is uh, publicly available and open source, so anyone can use these examples uh, for machine learning applications. So this is very uh, basic. Um, we created our own 20,000 labeled examples. Um, we created a stratified example because imagine if you have 20,000 examples, you can just throw them on the map because um, um, many, of these, um, many of these polygons that we will ask students to label will be not urban. So we did a stratified um, sample, created these um, examples. Um, so now we have 20,000 labeled polygons. They are labeled as built up or not built up. If a polygon has more than 50% of it is covered with built up land cover, it was labeled as built up. Else, not built up. So this is the response. This is the labels, what we want to predict. Uh, which data will we use to predict? Um, in this case, we used um, Lancet data. As, as we said, Lancet is collecting data from every location on Earth every 16 days. But some of the scenes have a lot of cloud coverage, right? So we need to remove those scenes that have more than 10% cloud coverage. Then, for each pixel, we calculate a median value. This value represents the value of the pixel, the median value of the pixel over the year. Additional to that, we also calculated other spectral indices, for example, NDVI, which is um, an index to map up, uh, vegetation, or NDBI, which is another index that is frequently used to map built-up land cover. So, now we have the polygons that we created. We also have these uh, per pixel values. We sample all the pixels that overlap with these examples. Each pixel will get the label of the overlapping polygon. So now we have, these are the, this, is what we want to, uh, this is what we want to predict, and these are the inputs that we provide. The, the, we teach the machine to learn what are the characteristics of a built-up pixel, label one, uh, what is the green color, what is the red color of it, what is the temperature of it. Based on that, we will try to predict the class of any pixel in the universe, very generally speaking. Um, we um, evaluated different types of classifiers. I will not get into th these details, but we found that um, random forest, um, 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 with random forest, we get an accuracy rate of around um, 80%, which is quite good in the remote sensing domain. But we also wanted to map all the built-up land cover in the, um, in the country. So you can see that um, here we can see the boundaries of the cities. Um, and here, when we zoom in, you can see that even with Lancet, uh, the free 30 meter resolution, we are able to detect the fine boundaries between uh, built up land cover and um, uh, vegetation um, in the surrounding area. Um, just uh, um, um, to illustrate, once we had the 20,000 labeled examples, to map the entire built up land cover in India took us a day or a day and a half. So it's very fast because we utilized Google Earth Engine. When we zoom out, you can see the fine boundaries of the cities, and then you can also use this algorithm uh, to map urbanization across space and time and apply this um, um, algorithm also on uh, past imagery. So this is one approach, which is obviously time consuming because 20,000 labeled examples for India, imagine how many examples we need for the entire world. 
So the next uh, uh, application that I will show utilizes ad administrative data as a source for these labeled examples. Uh, we did this um, study for um, the World Bank um, to map uh, built up land cover and land use in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. In this case, we used um, administrative data as our source for training examples. Uh, we classified this administrative data into three classes, built up residential, built up non-residential, and not built up. You know, in a remote sensing, usually um, 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 we use, um, in remote sensing, usually uh, um, it is used to map a built up, it is used to map land cover. In this case, we wanted to, sh to show whether we can also use remote sensing methods to map land use and differentiate between residential and non-residential land use. So we utilize two um, sources of free satellite data. One is Landsat, as we discussed, 30 meter resolution. The other one is um, Sentinel, Sentinel-2, which is the electro-optical imagery, and also Sentinel-1, which is radar-based or SAR-based um, imagery. We wanted to see whether, if we will combine these two sources, we will improve our classification. And we found that um, with this data, with this administrative data, we got an accuracy rate of um, 81%. And also, in differentiating between residential and non-residential land use, we got 67% accuracy. Now, the problem we, uh, that we have is class noise, meaning we have the polygons, but what happens, we do the pixel-based classification. If we automatically classify each pixel according to these polygons, obviously we will have a lot of noise in the data. So we also created our own um, random stratified data set, in this case of 15,000 labeled examples, and you can see that we improved the accuracy rate, 96%, and also in differentiating between residential and non-residential land use, uh, we got 79%, um, which is very good um, um, in terms of land use. Um, and here you can see a map of um, the classification, and you can see that we can even identify these um, um, individual structures on the map, just to show the difference between Lancet and Sentinel here on the right. Then the third um, case study, which I will do fast, uh, but this is the most, I'm proud of it most. Uh, um, this uses nighttime light data as a source to extract labeled data to map built-up land cover in high resolution. And the idea is that um, nighttime lights are a very good proxy for um, GDP, population size, and they are also used to map um, urbanization processes and changes in cities' boundaries. And the main assumption is that uh, we take the, um, the intensity of light that is emitted at night, we define a given threshold, um, any pixel that exceeds this, pix uh, this threshold can be defined as an urban area. But you can also see in this image that um, it is very coarse. Uh, the resolution in course, there's a blooming effect or diffusion of light. So what we did in this study, um, we relied on two sources. One is the nighttime light data. Uh, we defined this uh, um, rough um, estimation of the threshold. Then ma many of the pixels here are vegetation. So we used Lancet data um, to determine where there are vegetation area or bodies of water, and we removed it from this nighttime light data. We threw examples on the map, and we labeled the, example, the examples according to where they fall. If an example falls in a highly lit area that is not vegetation, it is automatically labeled as built up, else not built up. This way, we can label millions of examples, um, and yes, they will not be as accurate as we want, but if we have many, many examples, we can get a relatively um, high accuracy rate. So again, Lancet data, nighttime light data, we use um, Lancet data to determine areas of vegetation. We remove them from the nighttime lights, train the classifier, and you can see that the result is in much higher um, resolution. But there are many things that we need to consider. How do we define highly lit pixels? How do we define vegetation pixels? Which inputs we will use for the classifier? What is better, a global classifier that can be generalized, or many, many, many small classifiers very specific to specific areas? So uh, we divided um, each country, um, India, Mexico, and the US, um, into hexagons, and uh, we treated each hexagon as an independent unit of analysis. Why did we use hexagons? Um, this is a very um, interesting uh, discussion on the advantages of using um, hexagons for analysis. It's also very sexy. Um, 
we used, um, again, Lancet um, 8 um, annual composites. As I showed you previously, we created annual composites and added other um, spectral um, indices. So now we have the pixels with all the um, inputs that we want to predict. Um, we defined the threshold of nighttime lights per hexagon. Because the problem is that if we want to capture also villages and small villages that do not emit a lot of night, a lot of nighttime light, um, then the threshold will be lower. This is why we define this threshold for each uh, um, hexagon independently. And you can see here the variations in this threshold. Um, in each hexagon, um, we um, identified those nighttime light data that exceed the threshold, which is either um, 95, if, it's, if it exceeds the 95th percentile in the hexagon, it is um, labeled as highly lit, else um, if it is lower than 75th percentile, it is labeled as not highly lit. Uh, then, um, in each um, hexagon, um, we remove the vegetation areas from the highly lit pixels, we throw the examples, and we label the examples as I showed you previously. If the example falls in an area that is highly lit and not vegetation, it is automatically labeled as built up. If it does not fall in a highly lit area that is not vegetation, it is automatically labeled as not built up. And again, this allows us um, to map, uh, um, to collect millions of examples uh, without label, labor intensive um, methods. Then we train the classifier, um, random forests. Um, the prediction of random forest is a, what is called posterior probability. What is the probability that uh, um, a pixel is built up? Um, there's another question, how do we do, if we want to take this posterior probability and convert it into a binary map, built up or not built up, how do we do that? So we used um, an OTSU method, which is a method um, for um, image segmentation. Um, any pixel that exceeded this threshold was labeled as built up, um, else as not built up. So here you can see this is the posterior probability map. And this is the binary map. All these pixels, um, um, the probability that is, it is built up exceeded this threshold that we defined with um, OTSA. Uh, we also um, validated the accuracy of this classification and we found that um, we got a balanced accuracy rate of up to 81%, um, which is pretty good. It's very close to what we found in the first study where we used uh, um, hand-labeled um, examples. Um, we also uh, wanted to uh, map urbanization density, not just built up or not built up. So we created um, a grid, a fishnet, and for each um, cell, we calculated the percentage of um, urbanization within the cell. This allowed us also to evaluate changes in density um, between cities. Um, I also don't have time to show how we can apply this method to map urbanization also across time. But the idea is that once you have a trained classifier that is trained with Lancet data from 2016 or 17, you can use the same trained classifier to map any uh, a previous year because it's the same satellite. We're using the same uh, features for classification. So to summarize, um, satellite data are becoming increasingly available um, at ever improving um, spatial and temporal resolution. Uh, we saw Lancet, we saw Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2. Uh, with cloud-based platforms such as Google Earth Engine, it is now possible to monitor urbanization um, across space and time. Um, and AI and machine learning can be utilized for urban research, including uh, the use of supervised image classification. But the trick is always how do we get these examples? And I showed you um, three approaches to collect this reference data manually using administrative data as a source and a very basic approach of transfer learning where we use nighttime light data as a source for um, um, to collect these um, labeled examples and there's of course trade-offs if you will um, hire people to um, label the examples obviously the accuracy will be um, higher but this is not very scalable um, uh, will not allow you to map urbanization in global scales so it depends on the application that you want to use this me method for if you want it for taxation purposes obviously you won't be able to uh, compromise on 70 something percent uh, but if you just want a rough estimation of urbanization in the country then you can uh, um, um, compromise so thank you very much
Any questions? So, uh, the part on stratification when you went from yeah. The uh, part on the stratification when you went from 75% accuracy to 95, in, I think it was in your second approach. Can you elaborate a little bit what, uh, what it is? What yes. Did so the, quest the question was, um, how did we improve the accuracy from 70 something percent with the administrative data to 90 something percent with the hand-labeled examples? And the reason we improved it is that the classification is done uh, uh, per pixel. If you um, get a polygon um, from administrative data, any pixel within this polygon will be labeled uh, similarly, built up or not built up. If you rely on points, then each point represents a single pixel. So there's um, much less noise. Another question? Uh, uh, so in the urbanization example, where you talked about uh, the noise, uh, there seem to be uh, patches of grass in, in gardens and stuff, right? Uh, but in this case, you, uh, you make the grid, and you classify the grid cell, right? Classified each pixel, yes. We classified each pixel. The classification was done per pixel, not per object. Yes. Okay, so, uh, oh, okay, so that was actually my question. Because in, in that case, would just modern high-resolution optical satellites just... Obviously, modern high, very high-resolution satellite data will be much better. Uh, but this data is not always available for developing countries, for example. Um, yes, if the pixel will be 10 by 10 centimeters, obviously the result will be better, and then you can do also object-based classification. But if you want to scale it up and do the classification at the level of a country, a region, or the world, then uh, um, you need to compromise on the um, size of the pixel. Hello. Um, I'm curious, how long does it take to run the classifications? How are you finding the, the times and the resources needed if Google Earth Engine was doing it? So Google Earth Engine is um, free. You don't pay for the uh, um, classification. Yes, you have um, limitations on, you won't be able to, um, 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 to to teach a classifier um, uh, with uh, millions of examples. But in the case of India, with 20,000 labeled examples, it took a few hours. Um, global, in global scales, it will take much more and you will need to you know, uh, um, uh, iterate um, uh, per country, but um, a few hours. Yeah. And again, the advantage is that I don't work for Google, right? Uh, um, I just see the advantage of using Google Earth Engine because you don't need to download or upload any data. You can do all the analysis on the cloud. And then you can just download the result, so you can download the map of your urban areas. Um, I saw the one in, on the slides that you also run uh, SVN, Correct. but uh, at the end, uh, it was too different, the results from SVN, SVN or which was kernel? Was lower. Yeah, I didn't go into all the specifics. I, I can show you all the um, specifics, but what we did find with, with SVN, <laughs> Oh, sorry. I was thinking of uh, what we did find with. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm excited. What, what we did find with um, SVM is that when we added more um, inputs to the classifier, such as NDVI and NDBI, we improved the classification because Random Forest knows how to deal with um, non-linear combinations, uh, while SVM does not. And this is why, when you add more features to SVM, you improve the classification. More questions. Time. So uh, I, I saw that on the Landsat uh, set of images that you had over a year, I think, or a period of time that you had, you were actually making an average across all the... Yeah, and I was wondering whether um, using... Uh, because if you do aggregation, you kind of lose some information in the, the process. Whether using the, all those images that after removing the, the ones with a lot of cloud, um, would it have an impact on the performance? Because I, I assume the, the trade-off there is that the uh, computation that you will, because you will end up with triple or more, like 10 times more data for the prof, yeah. So, 
Yes, you are right. Uh, um, I think that um, creating annual composites for four seasons would improve the um, accuracy. Um, but in terms of computation time, it would take more time. Uh, we also did a f another um, um, a few research projects for, uh, for the World Bank on mapping um, agriculture land productivity, and then o there obviously you need to, um, um, even a quarter will not be enough, you need to do it every two weeks. Hi, uh, I wanted to know if you have a study on what went, went missing in the classification. So if you have an idea what was the finest urban scale you managed to detect with these methods, or which kind of problem you found in this. So the finest uh, um, the finest resolution is obvi obviously depends on the um, um, resolution of the satellite. Um, here we used um, Sentinel, Sentinel-2, which is in a special resolution of 10 meters, and you can see that we are even able to detect individual structures. Um, so you won't be able to extract the footprint of a building, but generally you will be able to detect the location of a structure. Thank you. I would like a round of applause for uh, Raphael and Ran. Um, thank you for your attention. This session is uh, over, and it's time for the lunch uh, in the first floor. Thank you.